welcome to Countdown to a Republic. I'm your host, Crystal Penny Bowen. And today I am here with historian Trevor Marshall at the historic Screw Dock in Bridgetown. Mr. Marshall, welcome. Thank you, <coughs> Crystal Penny Bowen. Now before we start and talk about the Republic, I want you just to tell us a little about the Screw Dock. Oh, the Screw Dock, which is on your the viewer's left, um, it is historic and historical. Completed in 1887, it is the only one of its kind in the entire world. It uh, consisted of iron rollers uh, through which um, the electricity passed and of, of a wooden platform. And there you see it about 100 meters long, 100 yards long. And it actually worked by the rollers ra raising that wooden platform to <coughs> take ships which have suffered internal or organic damage, lift them about 30 feet in the air between the poles and uh, effect um, repairs. That is what the screw dot was and it worked from 1887 until about the 1970s. Yeah, as a matter of the fact the Barbados Trident was the last ship repaired here. So the screw dot is there and it is in need of repair. It is a very useful historical museum piece. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, information. And now we're going to talk a little about the Republic. As you know, the Prime Minister made an announcement that we are moving towards a parliamentary Republic. And so tell me, how do you feel about that move Barbados is making? Well, on a personal note, <coughs> in 1966, on the 29th of November, I, as an 18 year old, was at the garrison. I saw I was part of the move towards independence. I was part of the ceremony on that night when midnight came and the tr Union Jack came down and the broken trident when I was there. The next morning as a cadet, I marched from the garrison through the city. So there was a feeling of elation. But yet, as a history student, I was told by my history teacher at the Lord School that Barbados had been independent since 1652. That after the invasion of the island by Sir George Askew, and he wasn't able to conquer the island on behalf of Cromwell. They had a treaty of Oystens, and Barbados was given the right, a number of rights which accrued to an independent island. The right to make its own laws, freedom from religious persecution, freedom from billeting of troops. <coughs> so according to Sir Alexander Hoyas, Barbados has been independent since 1652. And what happened in 1966 was just a codification of that rule. So since 1966, we have been in the waiting room to move to a new status. Um, some of us felt that Barbados should, should have become a republic on the 30th of November 1966. So on a personal note, I am happy that I am alive to see our republican status being ushered in. Um, as an academic, we recognize that things in Barbados take time and <coughs> that Barbadians are not really ready, and I say it concretely and bluntly, they're not ready for the status of republicanism. They don't know what it means. It's so interesting that you actually mentioned that, and I just wanted you to kind of go in a little deeper about whether we are still very connected to that colonial past. So if you could just go in a little on that and that impact of colonialism on right. Barbados. Well, of course, you know, we are both products of Little England. There was a Little England. Barbados was considered uh, the chiefest jewel in the England, the King of England's crown. It has been attached to England since 1627. It was not a colony of conquest like Jamaica. It was not a crown colony like Montserrat still is. It was a colony of settlement. So it is as though we were Englishmen abroad. Therefore, we owed an alliance and allegiance to the British crown. And I think among Barbadians, it is not so much the allegiance to the British Parliament or the politicians, but to Queen Elizabeth II. After all, she has been Queen of Barbados since 1952. That's 69 years. Um, <clears throat> right? And therefore, there is some angst, some nervousness and anxiety among Barbadians at the thought of leaving the Queen behind. Not leaving England behind. Because I think we've moved away from the concept of England as a welcoming mother country. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> people, your grandfather and my father and others who went to England discovered that England was the wicked stepmother that 
they had the notion of no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. And England has weaned itself <coughs> only slowly out of that idea of um, d um, describing blacks as niggers and condemning them and wanting to get rid of them one way or another. So England has not been a beautiful place for black people. So to get away from England constitutionally was not a problem despite England's new universities, England's cricket, and England's football with which we have allegiances and alliances. But the <coughs> what I think agitates Barbadians is the idea of getting rid of the Queen. And um, one cannot explain it except to say that we have been tied to royalty for all of our history. We have known no other head of state but the King, King George VI. There's a King George VI Memorial Park in, in St. Philip and there's Queen of England. Um, since June 1952. So how do I feel? As I said, I feel a sense of elation that on the 30th of November or whenever we will become a full self-governing own account country. But as a Barbadian and an academic, I am aware that not all Barbadians share that feeling. There are pockets of resistance in Barbados to the notion of republicanism. And it's not only among <coughs> columnists like one who writes in the nation every Friday or, or minority ethnic groups. Um, it's not only among them. It is a number of black Barbadians too who would argue that the constitutional tie to Britain is, in, is an, an indissoluble one. We are the products of 1627. Therefore, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And there are also people who think that republicanism brings into being a number of those terrible consequences which we associate with republics in the Caribbean and in Latin America. The so-called banana public, republic, banana republic in which <coughs> there is the law of the jungle under the, um, un the law of the jungle under the the notion of constitutionality. You get presidents for life. You get absence of uh, elections, uh, suppression of opposition parties, uh, personal liberties being um, sequestered, etc. And as an acad academic, I am daily being be besieged by Barbadians, ordinary working class Barbadians who wonder, and they wonder openly, what does republicanism mean for me? Will I be able to take my cases to the courts? Will I be free from police brutality? Um, will a politician simply be able to like, change the name of my street? Right? If I'm living in the Royal Avenues in Bank Hall, King Edward, Queen Victoria, Buckingham, Prince of Wales, uh, can the politician simply change the name of those streets? Can they change arbitrarily Queen's Park? Um, all those things. And these are people, these are things that people bother about. And you know, you can tell them, you can preach from now to never a morning, okay, it's just a matter of replacing the queen with a Barbadian native as head of state. That person will be a figurehead like the queen. The president of Barbados under a Republican constitution will still continue to sign the, um, the retirement notes for civil servants, will still uh, be greeting the hundred year old persons and still carrying out those functions. It is just that the person will now be president. And you tell them, well, no longer will we have Royal Barbados Police Force. It will be the Barbados Police Service. The scouts and guides will no longer swear allegiance to the Queen, her heirs, and other persons. Um, the uh, other groupings in our society which have Royal will abandon those. You tell people that's all the difference is it. But people are concerned. They're concerned and I think that we could or should have spent about a year advising people what republicanism mean. Because look, one of the most solid and sound republic republics in the world is in this region, Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a republican status and they have elections every four years and every one of their presidents is allowed to serve only one term. One term. That's not enough 
for them to engage in corruption and, and, and any denial of the citizens' rights. So Costa Rica is an oasis of peace and justice in a region which is not known for <coughs> peace and justice. Look at Haiti, assassination of a president in a republic. We, we Barbadians look at Trinidad and Tobago, and we know that Trinidad went to be in a republic on the 24th of September 1976. That's 45 years ago. What has happened in Trinidad? You've had two attempted coups and a revolution. You've had all kind of uh, problems uh, with the citizen versus the state, etc. The only thing in Trinidad, you've had regular elections. So people wonder. They also wonder, they look at Cuba. Okay, the Cuba was under the Castro's from 1960, um, right, 6061, until the Castro's demitted office. One died, Fidel, the other one demitted office. And, but there is the notion that Cuba represents the ultimate in uh, waywardness in terms of the state versus the citizen. There's also Venezuela with President Maduro. And whether we, whether it's true or not, people see President Maduro as um, another Putin or some uh, no, Ceausescu or uh, the man in Iraq, Saddam Hussein. So briefly speaking, Barbadians are not kosher with the idea of republicanism. There are some of us who are academics who have been conjuring with the notion of republicanism for a long time. For me, since 1966, at 50, um, 50, 50 um, what, 57 years ago, I thought we should have been rep republic. But for the generality of Barbadians, it is a matter of wait and see. Okay, you, 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 you put a lot in, actually. I had some questions there that I wanted to ask, but you answered them. But I think what you're drawing to me is that importance of the voice of the people. Mm -hmm. Now, with this new system, do you think there is more opportunity for the people to really have that voice, to speak out about certain things that concern them or they want changes? You know, we have the issue of same sex and marijuana, legalizing marijuana. So I in a system of a republic based on, on your, your views and what you've seen so far, do you think that the republic will facilitate something like that, where the voice of the people will be? Well, obviously I would not know. But in anticipation, in preparation for this interview, I called some of my CXE colleagues from Trinidad. And with one lady who had been a principal until her retirement a few years ago, and I had a 45 minute conversation and I asked her the same questions you're asking. What, is, what has been the experience of the average Trinidadian with republicanism since the 24th of September 1976? And she said basically, being in a republic means you do your own thing. But then again, come on, we know from Sesame Street, one of these kids are not like the others, the others are conforming, the others doing his own thing. So. What does that augur or bode for us? She said, well, you know as a republic, you set your own rules. And that will be summed up in the Republican Constitution, which is being worked on right now by the Republican Constitutional Review, Constitutional Review Grouping. And this is the point that you are, it gives the opportunity for all groups, all groups, cultural groups, social and uh, recreational groups, ethnic groups, etc., to band together and to make demands on the republic. For what? For justice, for equality of treatment, and for opportunity for them to uh, expand their abilities to what? Actualize themselves. The, according to her, within a republic, the average citizen now recognizes even more so than before the concept of united we stand, divided we fall. Because if we do not unite ourselves, the government, the government without any checks and balances can impose brutality, dictatorship, tyranny on us. So she has argued that within Trinidad, you see that since independence, that a number of groups which were uh, hitherto um, um, suffering from under-representation and even from brutality. For example, the spiritual Baptists. 
the Spiritual Baptist in Trinidad suffer discrimination. Now, since the Republican state, the Spiritual Baptists have demanded and they have their own public holiday. Their religion or their uh, religious uh, grouping or sect has the same respectability as Hindus and Muslims and Christians. And she says it is not that you look to government and expect government to do that, but you make demands on government. Now we are a republic. We, the citizens, we demand X, Y, Z. And also, that has implications for your politicians. Um, right now, Barbados is in a, a unique situation in which there's 29 to 1. That's unheard of. The present government can make changes, can alter the constitution, uh, can do anything because they have a, a preponderance in parliament. They have an overwhelming vote. Now, what um, when you're doing politics 101, you, taught, uh, you were taught about interest groups and pressure groups. Now is the opportunity for pressure groups. Some of them may be political amalgams. Some of them may be ethnic groups. For example, your whites, your Muslims, your Hindus. Now is the time for them to band together and put pressure on government to deal with them fairly with justice and Lower and even out and level the playing field. So according to this lady, the experience of Trinidad shows the necessity of people coming together, uniting within their own grouping and their own sphere to put pressure on government to uh, deal justly and with fairness to all groupings within the society. Rastafari here, for example, the Rastafari would or should uh, take um, that kind, that notion very seriously. That now Rastas can say, um, there shall be no, no Rastafari person shall have their hair cut in a situation where they are come up against the state, in a situation where they are arrested or come to court or whatever. Uh, there's something about which I feel very strongly, which is that Rastafari little boys going into primary schools have to wear a tam to hide their dreadlocks or their little locks while Rastafari girls um, can wear thousands dreadlocks um, what afro puffs cornrows etc the little boys must cover their heads that must not continue in a republic it cannot continue in a republic uh, similarly women in this society well, most women in this society have their freedoms in fact people can argue that women are more free now than males but they're still, you have still Muslim women in society, in this society. And as a historian, I know the Muslim religion and its uh, society in and out. And Muslim women are still a subordinate grouping. It is up to the Muslim women in society to make a claim within the context of the Republic for them to, uh, not to have to wear the hijab. I mean, I always, I used to wonder why do Muslim women always have their head covered? Is it that they have bad hair? You know, or God intended them to be bald. But according to the tenets and the dictates of their religion, they have to be prominent, modest. And furthermore, they have to cover their faces. Burqa. In a republic, in my republic, I would do like France. You cannot, as a woman, cover your head and face in this society. That may sound radical. Muslims might want to come against Trevor Marshall. Bring it on. If I were president of this republic, prime minister of this republic, no Muslim woman in Barbados would be forced to wear a head covering or face covering. And that is what, to my mind, republican status means. That groupings which were hitherto subordinated, submerged, or were less than full citizens, now have the opportunity to make a case to the state against these areas and these instances of subordination and ruthless misogynistic uh, dealing. So far from the status of, of being a republic having negative consequences for their citizen, right? Apart, according to the lady from Trinidad who gave me quite a lot of information and from what I've seen in other places, Costa Rica, etc., there is no open opportunity, ample opportunity for the citizen as a member of a group to make demands on the state and say, well, if you don't give us this, we are going to march. Okay, Mr. Marshall, I'm going to pause there. We're going to, we're going to, 
we're going to go to some software elements now of yeah. this change. Now, you mentioned, I believe you wrote an article in the Nation about the changes, or changing of names and so on. So, based on what you've heard so far, what are some of the things you think should change and shouldn't change due to this transition? <laughs> That's a good question, which means I don't know how to answer it. But let's try. What should change? Well, we've already heard, I mean, we've already talked about those groupings, parastatal, etc., which have royal in front of them. That goes without saying. Um, I mentioned in the article, and I, it was tongue in cheek, whimsical, that you may want to change Princess Margaret School to, let's say, Sam Lord School or Nanny Greg School or Queen's Park to Ernest Motley Memorial Park. Uh, but then again, when you look at Trinidad, after 45 years of Republican status, there's still Queen's Park, the Queen's Park Savannah. There's still Queen's Hall, where they have um, oratorical and verse and singing competition. There's still Queen's Royal College, their premier school. Guyana has still Queen's College, which is their premier boys' school. So should those things change in Barbados? Should the Royal Avenues change? Again, it is up to the people. I don't think that government should heavy-handedly say, no, we are a republic, we are doing our own thing. No longer will there be a Queen's Park. It will be Ernest Motley Memorial Park. Or no longer will there be a King George V Park. It will be a Sam Lord's Park. Uh, no. Uh, to repeat the point, this is now an opportunity for an open and uh, 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 an open and, and very honest and robust conversation between government, which means the party in power on one hand, and the people on the other, that everything now in the republic must be negotiated. What are we going to do about street signs and street names and other symbols um, of the British presence here? Are we going to just by legislative fiat say away with them put it to the people to put it to the people either by a plebiscite which is a local referendum or a huge uh, pan Barbados referendum what do you think what should be the symbols of our republican status do we change our our high profile spaces uh, some have been repurposed some have been pulled down. What do we call them? Do we install new, um, new models of what? New, new, new models of obeisance and allegiance instead of Queen's Park, the People's Park. It has to be a conversation between government and the people. And from my way of thinking, government in a republic in Barbados a place which is so ultra conservative governments would be advised to move carefully carefully in touching not the Lord's anointed but touching those spaces and names with which people have grown up right you do not have to destroy the legacy of the past in terms of names Queen's Park Queen's uh, college etc in order to establish for the world that you are a republic and that you're doing your own thing and that you are a master or mistress of your own reality and that you are engaging in self-actualization it is more what you do to and for the citizen because the generation which is coming up the millennials born after 1980 our generation next born after 2000 they may decide look it's about time that we had our own heroes identified in these public spaces. No problem with that. But for us right now, uh, on the advent of republicanism, to say from the 1st of December, we're going to use our hatchet to cut down everything that says royal or queens. Or to, as some people have suggested, um, drive people out of the plantation great houses and take over those things, those areas. Nah, nonsense. That's nonsense. A republic does not mean that. 
The Republic means that constitutionally you have left the embrace and perhaps not, not just embrace but the, the clutches of the former colonial power. And the point to be made, and I think this point is lost on a number of people. We just had the Tokyo Olympics. 206 countries of the world were represented. Of those 206, 14 were not republics. 14 were not. 192 countries of 206 coming together are republics. Barbados is among those 14, which is not a republic. It seems to be a movement, an, an honorable movement, a straightforward movement, a movement without any, any uh, kind of derogatory or insidious or sinister side effects to it. It is simply a stage. Ultimately, all of the countries of the world will be republics. And Trinidad, Guyana, Dominica, they have led it within the... And they're still members of the Commonwealth. They still give the Queen respect. They still have a fraternal relationship with Britain. We still get um, there. Sorry, still send their children to England. Uh, the Shevening scholarships, Commonwealth scholarships. They go to British universities. Um, when they're in England, they salute the Queen. Uh, they observe due deference to the members of the royal family, etc. And most Barbadians are proud that Meghan Markle, a non-white woman, has breached that seemingly <laughs> obdurate and granite wall of racial exclusivity. Yeah, the royal family. Right? And we, we, we're good with that. So I don't think that we need to do anything more than what we are doing now. Continue what we are doing and make just and sagacious and well-considered and common-sense decisions. And this is, to my mind, what Republican status means. Okay. So we're winding now. Just two more questions to go. Um, so, as you know, November 30 is the day for the Republic. But it's also our independence. I know Trinidad has two separate days. Yeah, what are your views? Yeah, what are your views on that? Uh, I'm ambivalent. Um, as I said, I'm a product of 1966. I was there, Independence Night, Independence Day, and to my mind, Independence Day, uh, November the 30th, is still Independence Day. Now, some people argue that Ms. Martin, the Prime Minister, as a Barbados Labour Party person, is being cunning, is cutting, you know, she's cutting the Guardian knot. She doesn't want to entirely destroy the Barbie, the Barra legacy, but she's listening to people who are saying, we should not have another day as a public holiday. We have too many holidays and killing two birds with one stone. And for the members of her party, who, by the way, did not support independence, I know that in 1966, that is undeniable. The Barbados Labour Party did not support independence in 1966. So independence in 66 was of the DLP, by the DLP, and for the DLP supporters. So for the Barbados Labour Party, who have always had problems with, 19, with November 30th, this is an opportune moment for them to join with members of the DLP in celebrating uh, a, a historic occasion. And now some people argue that in time to come, as crazy the Calypsonian says, in time to come, independence will mean no longer borrow an independence, November 30th, you know, but it will mean Miss Motley and Republic status. If that is to be the case, it will be the case. But it is also a clever move. And not clever in the sense of uh, cunning and underhand, but it is, is a way of uniting the country. I think that if you have the same day as Independence Day and Republic Day in a place like Barbados, where we have been so divided over independence, it is a beautiful way, an excellent political means of uniting the country, right? So that the Barrowites who still regard 
uh, 30th of November as Barrow's signal contribution to Barbados. And the people who supported Sir Grant Lee Adams, Tom Adams, Bree St. John, uh, Owen Arthur, and now Miss Martley, that they can say, we now have a good reason to celebrate November the 30th. And this is how politics operates. It may not um, really, it may not satisfy some of us. Some people will want a separate day between Independence Day and Republic Day. But politics is a matter of the possible and the art of compromise. So having November the 30th as both Independence Day and Republic Day is, I think, a very shrewd compromise. And that's my position on it. Okay. My final question. So as a historian, um, what, does the, what does the change to Republic for Barbados mean? You know, as a historian, what does that really mean to you? Uh, as a historian, it means that we historians will have more work to do. People will now want to know what was Barbados as far back as in time. And I'm thinking that perhaps we sh the original name for Barbados, the Carib name, Ichiruga name, I-C-H-I-R-O-U-G-A-N-A-I-M, that there should be an order of Ichiruga name, uh, a kind of order uh, commemorating or celebrating some outstanding activity by some person. So we go back to the Carib name. Some people, Dominica, Guyana and others have gone back to the original indigenous name, the aboriginal people, to inject into their status as a republic. Now as a historian, I know it has started already. People bombard you with questions of what Barbados was like in 1627, before 1627. Is it really Barbados, lost Barbados, island of the bearded fig trees? Or is it the island of the bearded men? We have that work to do. We as historians have to uh, chronicle who were, who were the 10 Africans who came here with the, with the 50 Englishmen. Can you get them? From what part of Africa did they come? We also have work to do to establish the African heritage in Barbados. For years, decades, centuries, we denied that we were an African people. And I congratulate Ms. Motley in seeking relations with Ethiopia, with Kenya, with Ghana, and establishing the point that the black Barbadian is descended from Africans. I mean, when I was at school, if you were called an African, that was an insult. And in today's um, situation, if people the hot-headed ones of today, if they were back in the 60s and somebody called them an African, they would shoot them, shoot them dead. Now we progress from that. We are not at the level of the Americans who call themselves African Americans with, all the, and, and with very good reason, but we are accepting that Barbados has African roots. Look, there are people going to Guyana every year to discover their roots, people from Barbados. And I remember when I went to Carrie Festa 1 in Guyana in 1972, I remember Alfred Pragnell uh, at the Sierra Gill saying, well, we in Barbados don't have any African heritage, but there was an African king, Jaja, who came to Barbados. That is nonsense. Today, nobody says that. Some people will say, I ain't an African, I is a Bajan. But we're talking about race, not space. You are of African descent, born in Barbados. That's undeniable. Good. So the historians now have to, we have to redouble our efforts to tell people where you came from. We can, if we can try, I think that one of the, what would be a tremendous coup for us as historians is if we could look at everybody in Barbados, every black person and say, you are from the Wolof people, the Akan people, the Yoruba people, the Ashanti, and it can be done, but it's an expensive process, DNA testing, etc. But people are going to look to us, the historians, to answer those questions. From where in Africa did we come? Good. Um, historians also have to identify and establish that the folk culture of Barbados is African. I mean, after all, look, Argentina. 
Argentina. You can't want a more white-oriented country in the region than Argentina. And they have established that their, their national dance, the tango, is of African origin. The salsa in, in, in Brazil, uh, merengue, cha-cha-cha in Mexico. Everybody is accepting that those are of African derivation. Calypso is of African derivation. All our up-tempo music comes from Africa. Our food practices, our cuisine. Um, we can go through a whole day eating and drinking African. Right? Starting with cocoa and coffee and bakes in the morning. Uh, okra slush and cuckoo and yam during the day. Conkeys in the afternoon. Sorrel at Christmas. Uh, cola tonic in the evening. All of that is of Africa. Historians have now to tell that to the, the children. And not just tell. We have to write books. Currently there are no books for children telling them concretely about our African heritage and how they came to, to be what they are, what complexion they are, and what Barbados has been. Historians now have to double down and tell our children through their books, their radio and television appearances what Barbados has been and why. I mean, and as we sit here near the screw dock and we look around, Barbados had a pirate as you look to the right. Um, Right? Not only um, Steed, um, what did man, Sam, Steed, uh, Steed Bonnet. We also have to tell children that Sam Lord was not a pirate. He was never accused of piracy in Barbados or in England. He did not die with a rope around his neck, as the Merry Men have sung. That is not history, that's myth. Good? We also have to talk, show people that a woman like Rachel Pringle was not a dowdy, dark-skinned, fat, retarded-looking woman. Sorry to use the term retarded. She was a brown-skinned woman. She looked like Santia Bradshaw. So those are things that historians have to do. We have so much work to do as we approach uh, Republican status. We have to totally re-educate the Barbadian populace, starting with children in primary school. We have to write books for them. We have to go to the schools. We have to tell them about, about our history. We have to tell them what happened in 1966, uh, independence, what happened before. We have to tell them about the ethnic groups in Barbados, um, the, uh, uh, the Muslims and Hindus, how they came here. They did not come as indentured persons. We have to tell them that all white people in Barbados are not vicious, Simon Legree persons during slavery that you had white slavery in Barbados. As you look to the right, um, Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan um, came from Wales, came to Barbados, came to Barbados as an indentured person, a white slave. Spent seven years here as a slave, got his emancipation, went off to Jamaica to become a planter, got fed up with it, went and joined the pirates. Became so successful that he retired from piracy, went back to Jamaica, became deputy governor general and he patented a rum captain morgan's rum when you look down there a hundred yards from here that is where captain morgan um operated from right a pirate also as we said the um casuarina trees are all that is left of an area called the baggage warehouse which is departure from which barbadians went off to panama we have to tell children that we built, we dug the Panama Canal. 60,000 Barbadians over a 10-year ten, ten period. One third of the entire population went to Panama to dig that canal, us and the Jamaicans. We also have to tell them that from here, from here, the baggage warehouse, people went off from Barbados to England in the 1950s and 60s as labor migrants to help England recover after the Second World War that we have a glorious history. So the world of historians in Barbados is not just to concentrate on the Republic and saying, during the Republic, you must do that. That's the role of future historians. Present day historians now have to do a, a recce, a reconnaissance exercise, and also to go back and to educate people about a history about which they know nothing. I mean absolutely nothing. 
I mean, we at Cape Hill and Community College, we congratulate ourselves when we graduate in a year, 40, 50 students with a degree in history and something else. But for those, you have 40,000 out there who know absolutely nothing about Barbadian history. So the role of the historian now becomes even more, um, even more focused and more concentrated and more urgent. In fact, at my age, I'm wondering how many more years I have on this earth. And I have about six or seven projects, including a child's history of Barbados. A child's history of Barbados, starting from the suicide period, the Pleistocene era, and coming forward. Because I have a granddaughter who's seven. I'm hoping that by 10 years old, she will have this in her hand. And that is what other historians have to do. Mr. Marshall, I want to thank you so much. You've given me a wealth of knowledge. And I appreciate you taking the time to come and join us for a countdown to a republic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.